I'm architect first, architect second, and it really has improved my practice. Business of Architecture UK, episode 55. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week's interview is in one of my favourite locations in the Tower Hotel, based by Tower Bridge. Uh, and I'm chatting with Barry Stott Brooks, who is the principal and founder of Architects Atelier. And he's actually one of the students, one of the clients of the Business of Architecture, and has been through. Um, the marketing program um, which has been developed by Enoch and Eric Bodrow and Richard Petrie in the US and it's it's had a real I mean this is a really really brilliant story of how he's taken his practice how he has implemented um, a number of disciplined marketing strategies how he's been able to completely turn around his practice how he has put in place some real fiscal discipline around the collecting of fees to make sure that he's being paid on time, how he's changed his mindset to be able to look at uh, his services as a product and how he's been able to market that and how, you know, he's been by putting together these marketing strategies, he's able to been able to grow his practice, um, get more of the kind of work that he enjoys doing, and it's given him a new lease of freedom and love in his work and in his career. So this is a really, you know, this is, a, I think, a great demonstration of the power of marketing and sales and how by educating yourself in these arenas in these areas you can really transform your business and of course if you are looking to work with the business of architecture yourself um, there will be an opportunity you can click in the link in the information um, and you can book yourself onto a strategy session call with one of our senior experts or you can send me an email and we can have a 15 minute conversation where we can kind of do like a diagnosis of your business um, and look at how best we know what kind of marketing implementation would be great for you. So sit back, relax and listen to Barry Stock Brooks. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host Ryan Willard and today we're sitting in near Tower Bridge and I'm with Barry Stock Brooks who's the director and founder of Architects Atelier. Welcome to the show. Thank you uh, Ryan, it's Barry. Um that's right. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for that welcome. Um, yeah, it's nice to be here. Nice to finally actually meet. We were sort of 12 months overdue from when <laughs> we originally arranged this. But um, yeah, it's been a very, very bu busy 18 months for both of us, I believe. Excellent. Yeah, no, it's a really, really good to have you on the show because you've really had quite a transformation in your business and you've been involved in you know, you're running a practice about six years now. Yes, correct. Yeah. You, you've gone through kind of working on smaller residential projects to now doing larger developments, working with developers, and you've also been involved, you're a graduate of some of the BOA, Business of Architecture courses that yep. have had quite a big impact on your, on your business. I wanted to say a big, a massive impact on my business. It really has sort of changed my mindset of being this architect to actually being more of a marketeer and actually being a businessman and actually sort of running my business and actually being in control of what I deliver as an architect. Mm. So it's allowed me to have a lot more freedom as being a as being an architect. So what, so what was it like before? So let's just, just go back and start like how you began your practice and what types of things you were facing, the obstacles you were, you were having challenges with. So yeah, um, I began the practice back in, 2013 and um, what happened there was I would actually been out in the UAE working for a small firm in Seven Oaks and I had the opportunity of going over there to set up a local practice in in a place called Fajira that no one ever heard of. I know Fajira it's uh, right next to um it's near to Dubai and um yeah, it's about 100, 100 kilometers from Dubai. Yeah. And it's just, on, it's just on the east coast uh, rather than the west coast. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a lovely town, and, but it's like 25 years behind what Dubai is now. So it was a real eye-opener for me coming from this sort of, you know, this urban jungle to actually being 
few and far buildings between mm. sort of having to be in the car everywhere you went you couldn't walk anywhere it was just too hot um so yeah so i was setting up this practice over there and we didn't really have the waster to sort of get in with some of the locals there to actually deliver any of the 150 feasibilities that i'd done in the in the three years that i've been there uh which was a real shame but i then realized that actually i should be putting this effort back in the UK and actually delivering my own practice. So like all brave songs back in 2013, I just went, do you know what? Let's, let's do it. Let's start my own practice. Day one opens up, you know, no clients, <laughs> no computer. Um, it was a, it was sort of like I managed to find an old laptop that I managed to sort of borrow off a friend and get a piece of what I would say... Um, tested software <laughs> um, that I managed to call AutoCAD and um, I was sort of, I think it was like something like TurboCAD or some, something like that and I was trying to deliver these drawings for extensions and at that time I was taking any job that I could get you know you ask your friends your family everyone that sort of ever knows that you've been an architect thinking oh I'm just gonna I'm gonna start on these big projects and I ended up sort of just grinding for the next sort of two and a half years grinding out sort of single story rears two story rears side extensions lock conversions and though i absolutely love those projects because every every client i've ever met has been fantastic and unique after a while they got so repetitive i forgot what project i was working on and who i was working for and it was sort of like the soul started to disappear on me and i just started to lose my way mm. in in terms of what am i doing as a practice i run this practice but all i'm doing is surviving and I'm living month to month, check to check, reliant on clients that are paying me, paying me, paying me well. And most of them weren't. Most of them weren't paying on time. Most of them were sort of like, they were letting me sort of roll with a project for, you know, eight weeks. And then I put it in for planning. And then another eight weeks would go by. And then I wouldn't, wouldn't have been paid. And so 16 weeks has gone by and you're sitting there going, I just, I just need a thousand pounds to put some food on the table, you yeah. know? And um, it was it was getting desperate, and um, I was sort of sort of listened to this business of architecture sort of spill, as it were, at the time. I was very apprehensive about it, about you know how you can sort of change your practice and how you can change your mindset and get bigger clients. And I was like, oh, bigger clients, that sounds interesting. How do I do that? And um, I sort of signed up to this very cheap introductionary course i think it was like 97 dollars. i think it was like 80 pounds or something like that and um i was hooked i was literally hooked within that first week i had already been speaking on the phone to um enoch sears in the in the u.s sort of been speaking to him and i just signed up for this course and i can't remember what the cost was now but at the time it was a massive risk take for me because mm. i've been living hand to mouth you know it was literally i'm putting all my eggs in this basket and I literally just went from this guy that had no idea, no marketing expertise, didn't really know how to position myself as an architect and know my own my own strengths, into this guy that all of a sudden starts going, well, this is my fee, take it or leave it. Mm. And, you know, oh, well, actually, you think I'm going to work for you. I'm actually interviewing you at the same time. And that gave me massive power and massive confidence. And I suppose that's where, you know, that's where the BOA has really given me confidence in myself as a, as a build, uh, as an architect and as a, uh, as a designer. So what, what were the first things that you started to implement? And what were the things that you realized you were doing that weren't working? I mean, the first thing was for me was always this, um, you know, it was all about me. I'm the architect. This is what I think. This is how I think your extension should look. And not listening to clients and not listening to what their wants were. For me, it was about, you know, that mindset of actually you're, you're a marketeer first, architect second. And actually, it was about listening, actually sitting back and listening to what the client was asking me, you know, and what they were actually after. And, um, you know, the conversations usually start with, you know, you know well, we want to build. We want to build a single-story rear extension. Okay, but why? Oh well, you know the conservatory just gets used as a dumping ground. And my res my response would normally be, well, what would stop you actually making your extension a dumping ground? You know, and and then we would start having these conversations rather than just designing and delivering. We would actually have a conversation about the space and how the family used the space, and start to ease them into the process process of what an architect actually can help them with and what they can deliver 
And so listening was a massive part of that for me. And then sort of implementing some of the guides and some of the ideas um, that the business architecture actually gave me straight to start off with. And then developing that resource later became, became you know, the, the main breadwinner. You mm. know, I, all of a sudden I started delivering more content, more sort of processes that the client could engage with and understand and under understand what we did and actually helping them deliver their own home you know i became i'm just a facilitator it's not about me it's not about me as an architect it's about it's about the client and their home and what they want and until i changed that mindset i wasn't really getting the clients and now i sort of have this client base that people now recognize it's a lot of it's referrals a lot of it is through the tools that are now put in place for this, um, as we were talking earlier, the dirty 30 list, as, as the BOA like to call it, you know, and, uh, you know, getting those contacts, getting those people, getting those email lists, and actually just keep delivering valuable content to potential clients. Mm. Actually gets you a lot further than just a, a yellow page list director you're saying architect. So can you give us an example of some of the pieces that you've implemented the sort of the, the exact strategy. So you mentioned then the dirty 30, the dirty 30, what's that? So uh, the dirty 30 is literally a list of 30 sort of contractors that I would like to work with in the next 12 months. Now, I know I'm not gonna get all 30 of those contractors, but I'm gonna target them with useful information uh, through via a newsletter or personal meetups, personal connections through LinkedIn or phone calls, where I've actually, I don't know these people, you know, it's like, it's a bit like cold calling, but I'm sending them a newsletter and my newsletter is not sort of like, it's two pages of A4 and I normally have a little tea bag and a post-it note on it and it sort of says, take a five minute break and read my newsletter, find out about what projects I've been working on for the last month. So there's a little bit about us, but there's a lot about what we're delivering for our clients. You know, so that is where the Dirty 30 newsletter comes in. And then, so, that's, and then, so that's a hard copy newsletter that you send out? Yes, it is, yeah. So we send that out. We send that out once a month. It normally goes out the last sort of last day of the month. Uh, it takes me about a day to put together. I don't spend any more on that because, you know, time is money. Uh, <laughs> so we sort of spend a day on that. Day sending it out. Um, well, I don't send it out, but other people send it out for me and then it's sent out and delivered and I normally get one or two phone calls saying Barry let's have a cup of coffee you know and I'm not going to get everyone and I will target the same list for about six to eight weeks or six to eight months sorry and then that list will then change because then I sort of the people that don't respond are probably not likely to respond so I will then take them off the list and then I will target another you know, another 10 people, as well as the people that are responding, to keep those connections going. One, that's the main part. And two, it's to refresh the list. So I really, out of that, I've probably only got about six people that I currently work with um, on, a, on a good month-to-month -month basis. But most of the time, it is literally just making those contacts. I mean, I was so scared about talking to people. I mean, I would have never done this. This interview now, I would have never done this two years ago. You know, th this would have scared the living daylights out of me but now I'm sort of a bit more relaxed and a bit more okay I've got I've got, I have got a voice you know and I am stronger in what I deliver and it's been it's been an interesting roller coaster you know I mean one of the other tools that I use and as I was saying earlier it surprises me a lot is the project planning pack you know it's something that I didn't even write I, you know it was written by a guy that is not even an architect he, he literally put this nine pages of A4 together and said oh here's an entry in how to be how to sell your product and literally I just sent it out as it was and I was getting responses I couldn't believe it I just couldn't believe people were like actually connecting with something so, so what, basic so, so what's in the project planning plan how do you how do you admit how do you distribute it yeah so the project planning pack um, it's literally has a bit about you know what the process is it takes you through nine steps it takes you through something called like a, read a readiness scale and during the process, we sort of talk about, you know, your project, where you stand in your project, you know, your ideas, the, 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 the six steps of where, where the process comes in for an architect through to delivery. We talk about, you know, what the fees are going to be or what your construction budgets are going to be. And then at the end, it's also about a readiness scale. And it sort of says, you know, if you're like nine and all, all of these, you're ready to build. But if you're only sort of like, you know, two or three, speak to us, we're an expert.
you know, and it's about making that first engagement. Now, I use this on all my um, email, well, internet traffic leads. So I sign up to, I sign up to these websites. You know, you've probably seen them at Upshoot and you know, there's Bark and there's all these other companies out there. And I sign up to a few of them, and I don't, I don't, don't use them all the time. But anyone that comes through that, I just send that straight out. I don't even, I don't even make a phone call. I haven't got time to make phone calls for those kind of projects. Mm. So I send that out, and you'll be surprised how many people then actually make contact with you. And like they say, oh, we've never seen this. You know, none of the other architects are giving us this information. This is a great little starting point of where to start, what questions to ask, how to engage with an architect. And I normally get a phone call saying, come around for an interview. And that is sort of my sort of my pre-qualification, as it were, because if they're calling me, they're serious. You know, if I was chasing every lead that came through it, you'll be surprised how many are like, oh, I just want a price. And I'm not interested in price. That's yep. not that's not what architecture is about. You know, that's not what we do. We we deliver we deliver nice buildings, and I want to have a conversation. My architecture is a conversation, and it's not all about money. And what kind of systems do you have in place for those phone calls? Is that something that you've worked on as well? Do you have like a? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another interesting. I mean. A few years ago, I got something called a call script that we had to sort of follow. Right. You know, and um, it was it was like 10 pages of A4. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to sell a client 10 pages of A4. They're just going to hang up on me in two minutes. And so I sort of rewrote my own call script with sort of key points of like, you know, what their readiness was, where they are in the process. Are they still at the information gathering stages? And you'll be, be surprised that... 80% of the people are at that information stage. You know, they're not ready to engage with an architect. So I would keep the conversation very flowing in terms of like, well, uh, it sounds like you're not quite ready, but it's your decision. We can help you, but let's le let's leave the conversation there. When you are ready, you come back to me. I don't sort of force myself upon them in a way that sort of says you must sign up and you must sign up to a, what we call a low commitment consultation. Uh, we don't sign them up straight away there and then. We sort of introduce ourselves, let them think about it. And if, if it's a good project that we're interested in, we may follow up with them. But 90% right. of the time, because we don't harass them, they come back to us. Because the guys that are architects that are chasing, they're the guys that are undercutting our fees. They're the guys that are sort of going, oh, we can do it for £600. But what are you getting for £600? I'm showing you value by having a conversation with you, by sending you a project planning pack. I've sent you all this information before time, and I'm actually building that trust. Mm. So by the time we've, by the time we've actually met, I am pretty much know I'm going to be 80% signed up on the door. All right. So how? So that's that's really interesting. That how you're you're kind of controlling the conversation and taking it away from being a conversation about price. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, um, price should be the last thing on their minds, really, because when you, if sometimes I sit there at the meetings and I sit there and go, my fee is probably only two percent of their whole budget cost, and I'm trying to work out if there's a diagram I can do that shows I'm only going to be two percent of your £200,000 extension. Look how small my fee is. And I'm trying to work out if there's a visual graphic I could do rather than just a pie, pie chart that actually shows, look how much value I'm going to produce now with that 2% of fee. Mm. And that that's something I'm trying to work on at the moment in terms to show, one, the process of how we work, but two, how much we, we don't charge. You know, our, our expertise does cost you but look how much we're going to save you in the long run. And so I try to sort of steer it away from fee, 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 fee at the beginning. And then sort of I get them so engaged and so emotionally connected with us that they sort of go, well, when can you start? And oh, how much is your fee, by the way? You know, it, when you can start comes before how much is your fee? I'm, 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 I'm signed up. I'm there. Yep. Because they already, that emotional connection is with me. And that is, that is the power I suppose, of the marketing that I've now been adopting. You know, it's all about that emotional connection rather than just selling. Mm. You know, we, you know, I think you've said it a few times, we don't like selling, we think it's dirty. I actually love it. I've now gone from this person that doesn't like selling to actually, well, what, what if I try this route and how can I sort of be this guy that is delivering quality but also, you know, being being right on my feet, being right on my feet is, paramount i want to make a profit now i don't want to be sitting there going oh i've got to deliver this job in two weeks because if i don't i'm not going to make any money and 
and, and unfortunately sometimes that does happen but that used to happen a lot four years ago the last two years it's been very much oh I've got, I've got a lifestyle business and I actually really enjoy it I really enjoy the clients I have my photographer turns around and says every client I've ever photographed has been overwhelmed every really happy and it's like yeah but I don't work with crap clients mm. I choose not to you know if they're, if they're arguing about money the day one no thank you you're not for me and I'm not for you so a few, a few other little things I want to go into detail. What, you mentioned the low-cost consultation. What, what is that and how is that, what is that as part of your, your, so, your sales and marketing process? Yeah, so low, um, in that call script, as we've got, is something called a low-cost consultation. To everyone else, it's a feasibility study, but we sort of dress it up as a way of, look, we want to look at your project. We want to sort of get you involved and committed early on. Um, you know, you, you're saying, oh, you know what you want, but actually, do you know what you want? And actually, can we help you open your mind to other options and other ideas? You know, the, you'd be surprised how many times people, you walk in and every architect's the same. They go into someone and go, well, we can make that space better. But you don't want to give that idea away for free because they've told you to do something else. Well, the way I do it is sort of do this low commitment consultation where I sort of say, well, look, we want to come and do a feasibility it's only a couple of hundred pounds and, you know, we can, we'll spend half a day with you. We'll draw out some sketch ideas. We'll show you how the spaces can work. So we're not just, we're not just giving you a one shot chance at getting the scheme right. And then we, and then they're engaged because they're engaged early and they're, they're making choices with you. You're designing the space because you're leading the conversation, but you're making them part of that conversation. You're actually saying, well, look, we could do it this way or we could put the kitchen this way, you know, not rather than some of the conversations, the early conversations I used to have were, well, yeah, I just want the kitchen at the back. I, you know, I want an island. I want a breakfast bar. You know, I just want a galley kitchen. I want bifold doors. Bifold doors are the bane of my life. And, <laughs> and I tell every client, I don't do bifold doors. You'll be surprised how many clients I've lost because of that. You know, and I don't do, I don't do them. I refuse bifold doors. Um, but th th there's so many clients out there that even though you've got planning, they'll still put bifold doors in after I've got them planning. They'll change the design and um, um, but I engage them early with the conversation and they're engaged with the project and they have fun with it because if, the, if they're not having fun with it they they end up resenting architects and they end up going oh I wouldn't work with that guy again yeah and they don't refer you and our business is referral you know if, if I'm working in Blackheath I want the next, I want the keeping up the Joneses to keep coping up with the Joneses I want that, the whole street I don't just want I just don't want the one client. I want to get three or four clients in that street. And so you'll be surprised that's happened quite a few times for us. And that's how our model grows, really. And so the low cost consultation, this is, this is like a day's work that you will do. And, uh, yeah. and, and, that, and that leads on to... Yeah, it's, it's, literally, the, it's literally half a day with them. I, right. I, spend, I literally spend half a day with them at their home, with them. Um, sometimes they do it on a Saturday. If I do it on a Saturday because they work, I do charge more. Um, but most of the time, people are willing to give up their sort of afternoons. You'd be surprised, Friday afternoon, I, um, you know, it's like LCC day. It's sort of like people go, oh, yeah, I'll have some time of work and we can think about it. And actually, they start to enjoy their weekend because Monday morning, I normally get a phone call saying, yeah, we want to go ahead. They've had time to think about it over the weekend. They've been discussing it. They've been out shopping. They've been sort of talking to friends about it. And all of a sudden, Monday morning comes around. It's like, yeah, Barry, can we go ahead? That, that, that third option that you did was actually, that's the money shot. And then I know I've only got to draw one option in the CAD machine. I, um, and, and, and I must implore other architects, please, please stop using Revit just to give you a final scheme and your design ideas because there's no flexibility. Clients see it as a one chance design and they're fixed with it. I love using the yellow tracing roll, sketch it all out of them. Everyone's engaged really early. And then, and then I'm, and then I've sold them on a product, and that is how I see my business is a product base. Mm. And it was interesting, actually. You were saying earlier about what what other revelations have you had about viewing your services as a product? Yeah. So <laughs> I sent you earlier on. It's like um, I was. I think I was in Dixon's, I think it was Dixon's then, um, and I was just looking at um, TVs, and I saw this sign sort of said. 50% now, take the, take the TV away from you today and, um, you know, pay the rest in, in 12 months' time. And I just sort of started looking at it going, 
I should be doing this in my business. I should be saying, oh, I'll take a 50% booking fee now and then I'll take the rest of it on delivery of the drawings. And literally overnight, I changed my cash flow from this negative 16 week to 20 week to like chasing, chasing, chasing red letters going out everywhere uh, to this cash up front. And all of a sudden I was getting 50% booking fees on everyone. And my, my account was like, what have you done? Where's all this money coming in? And he was just so surprised that I just by this one tweak, I went from being this cash negative person to cash positive very, very quickly. And I now sort of, I'm a lot more relaxed when someone, someone sort of says, oh, uh, I'm not going to pay your invoice this month because, um, you know, I'm actually, I've actually, I can't pay it. I can't afford to pay it. Was that okay? Well, you, you've got another 14 days, uh, and but then I will send you. Uh, I will pass this on to debt collectors and I, I implore any architect out there, get yourself one of these guys. They're like, you know, you spend 30, 40 pounds, they'll pay you what you're owed minus their fee, but then they'll chase the client for it. And I know some people sit there and go, oh, I can't do that. I'm working with them. Trust me, the client will then start paying your bills quicker and on time. They're, 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 they soon realize that can affect their credit rating. There's We've been too long as architects, always been negative and always been chasing payments where now I run a cash positive, cash flows up front. I'm happy, client's happy, and the client is engaged. As soon as they put that 50% down, the conversation happens. They start saying, well, when can we start seeing the first scheme? Rather than just letting you draw and draw and draw. They want to see what you're drawing, what you're delivering for them. And... I think that works a lot better because my conversations with them are a lot smoother mm. and a lot more upfront, you know, and there's no secret, there's no agenda at the end of it where they start saying, oh, I was thinking about actually changing it to this now or I want to make this structural change because I've been designing with them all the way through. We've been constantly going. And if they then change, well, that's when my hourly rate kicks in. And yep. they know that. They know that from day one, you know, and yeah, my cash flow is, you know, much better for it. And then, can't take anything wrong from that. And, and, that's, and, that, and that's all from going around Dixon's going, oh, that's a good idea. That's that 50% up front and then pay nothing. I was like, oh, I, I must start getting more cash in early up front. Yeah. So, and to see my business as a product. So, and that's what it is. And, and how do you negotiate that upfront fees with, the, with your clients? Is it the conversation that happens on day one? You, yeah, you, well, if we. <laughs> I mean, if I do the LCC route, it's not day one. It's normally day two. Well, it's normally on the Monday. So the LCC gets them, gets them hooked in, gets the ideas flowing, gets them intrigued in what you can deliver. And the LCC doesn't actually mean I get appointed. I say, look, you've got some sketch ideas now. You can go down to a technician or someone like that to deliver it. Obviously, they're only going to get those drawings. They're not going to get the mindset of what we were talking about or the back history. There's no brief there. There's no, you know, they only get a, a written brief of what we decided, but there's no actual continuity of that design idea. So, so a lot of my conversations are the Monday morning when they say, let's go. I say, well, you know, my fees is 5% of the construction cost. You said your budget was this. Uh, my fee is 5% of that. And then I say, well, out of that, we're going to do stage stages one and two. I'm going to charge you sort of 2% on that. And then I break that 50% up front, 50% on completion for uh, either pre-application planning or actual planning, and then the remainder of the stages. So as it goes through, there's always ca I'm always cash ahead. I've always invoiced ahead. So, you know, planning, I've already been paid for. Building control, I got that when I submitted the planning drawings. And then when I'm on site, well, I actually get the rest of the building control money. So that's going to see me through. And if there is a little bit left at the end and they start arguing about it, that's when the red letters come out. Because yeah. there's only a, there's a, but there's only a really small proportion of that fund money left, you know, and we make it as small as we possibly can. The nice thing is, well, I call it a retention for the client to make sure we complete our job as a contract administrator. And so I call it a retention for them and I say, well, once we've finished and the six months defects has happened or whatever we've agreed, I'll get paid. And then everyone's happy. You know, there's, you know, I call that last little bit, you know, the extra profit, you know, the, the, the sort of <laughs> take, take the wife out for the a cherry. Yeah. Take the wife out for a dinner or something like that kind of thing. Let's get this, let's get this, let's go on holiday. So, um, you know, it's, it's those kind of, it's that mindset that I've got into now, really. Brilliant. And how have you... 
how does this how does these processes change for say your developer clients because you've moved you were saying you've moved from from working for lots of domestic projects and now doing more work with developers how does the how yeah. does how does the how do these systems how have you adapt these systems so yeah for developers it's it's been interesting because a lot of my developers are they were sort of in the process of just buying houses flipping them you know i was doing little drawings for them and they were sitting there going oh barry would love your drawings we want to look at something a bit bigger and so i started hand holding these little developers through you know buying houses to flip to sort of you know sell on as larger family homes to now looking on virgin sites together looking at sort of doing a feasibility and we don't call it we don't call it lcc then because i'm already engaged with the developer i sit there and go well let's look at let's look at feasibility for the site viability of what we can actually deliver on that site and then sometimes when the money doesn't quite work their end they will still buy the site do the planning and then sell the site on so i, I know i'm going to get some sort of planning fee um, again, I'm still I'm still cash rich because I still sort of go money first deposit. I still take them through that same ritual with a developer. I don't care what sort of size developers they are. I, I still ask for a deposit. I still sort of take them through the process and invoice straight away. Now, it's very hard with some of these developers because they want you to sign up, but I I stick to my guns and I sit there and go, no, I'm not signing up to your 30 days, 90 days terms. If you want to engage us, we're a small we're a small practice. You know, in reality, there's only me. I'm a sole practitioner. Everyone else that works with me is on an agreed fee. So, what are, you, what are your what are your day terms? Your terms. So terms my, of my my terms of payment are fifty percent up front, and then on that final invoice is seven days, and then they get a next seven days to pay up. And if after those fourteen days they haven't paid up, they then get I then defer that on to a debt recovery agency, and I don't care if they're a developer they will get a letter and believe me or not they pay because they want to work with you and and you'll be surprised you have so much power you own the drawings everyone forgets you own the copyright you own the drawings you can literally cease any more drawings coming out of your office until debt's been paid you know and people don't really ever, I used to be really afraid of doing that and I used to be really afraid of sort of stand up to these guys and sort of saying look you're not you're not getting you're not getting any more drawings out of me until that's been paid and they, but you get into their mindset of time is money, and you start sort of saying, "Well, look, there's penalties, and you're paying those penalties. I'm not. You know, I can sit on these drawings. It doesn't bother me. You know, I've I've, I've been paid. I've already been fifty percent paid up front. Mm. You know, that you, you want to sit on that invoice and don't pay it. That's up to you. But by the way, you're not getting your construction set of drawings until that invoice is paid. You know, that's that's my terms, um, and. The developers see time is money and they want to get on and want to build it. They don't want to lose their builders. They're paying builders, you know. Uh, I got told the other day a bricklayer is now getting £300 a day. Now, if a bricklayer sitting there and he's waiting on my junction detail for two weeks, who's paying his wage, you know? Oh, that, builder's, that builder's not getting paid. He's walked off somewhere else. Mm. And, that, and then the company have got to find someone else. So they don't want all the aggro. So get into, get into the mindset of being a contractor. Be ruthless. You know, be that kind of guy that's going to demand those terms. And it's your terms, not their terms, because, you know, they want to work with you. If you're the best at what you provide, they'll, they'll, they'll take it. They'll do it. So, Amazing. Yeah, so, but this is, but I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking massive developers. I'm talking people that are, you know, up to 15, 20 units. I, these are the kind of guys I, I've sort of turned a lot of these smaller house builders into sort of people that are building eight units, 10 units, 12 units. You know, I'm not talking... Bigger, bigger boys. I am talking the smaller, the smaller firms. So if you are a sole practitioner, and they think they have you over a barrel, do not be afraid. You know, just do be ruthless. You know, otherwise you will, otherwise you'll never get anywhere. You'll be sitting there crying about, well, I haven't been paid this month, and that means you know, little Tommy can't go to his private school. Well, I bet they're still driving around their BMW, sitting there going, well, it's all the architect's fault, and you're sitting there claiming the contractor. Just be, just think like a contractor, and just be ruthless and say, I want my, I want my money. Mm. I deserve it. I've earned it. You know. Brilliant. Yeah. And have you got any plans to move into development yourself, or or get, or get involved in that side of the business, or is it you're still happy just doing? architectural services and yeah, running a very effective company it's something it's something i have been toying with for the last sort of 12 months a couple of the, a couple of the smaller builders that i've been helping through the stepping stones have been asking us uh do jvs on sort of smaller sites and that and but i'm quite happy being this you know sole practitioner 
that sort of runs an office out of Dartford, that has colleagues that he can rely on to deliver these projects. I actually quite enjoy that. I think if I start getting down the route of being a developer as well, I think a bit of my soul would disappear with me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I think I think for the time being, no. I think, I think I'm still going to be that practicing architect and... That's what I love doing. So can you tell us a little bit about how your office is set up, how you work, how you work with other people? Uh, yeah, so I... Because um, it's a streamlined machine. Every, <laughs> part, every part of this is brilliant. Yeah, so the, so the office now is, is... I'm the only name above the door. You know, I, you know, there was a tutor, Tony Clelford, that used to say to me, he goes, oh, you want to get that gold plaque on your front door as soon as you can and then you'll set up a business. Trust me, when that day came, I, I didn't want to put a gold plaque up. I actually wanted, wanted to go and run and hide. Um, but I started thinking about the model of my architect's practice and what, what I wanted it to be. Now, at the beginning, I wanted a team of four people, you know, to actually just streamline through design, through to delivery. And I only take on projects all the way through to delivery. I won't take on anyone's project if they turn around and say, oh, can you deliver us a building control set of drawings? Not interested. Can you just do a design? Not interested. You know, I want I want to see a project all the way through for that quality control from our point of view. Okay. Plus, it also guarantees a long-term fee. So, um, the way I work it now is I used to have employees. Um, and then about 18, 19 months ago, I decided actually I didn't want to grow as a practice. I could run it as a sole practitioner and actually have colleagues and friends that I appoint as a as a contract basis and they come in we agree a fee and then I employ them to deliver either a structure engineering or I deliver them to technical drawings um, or work with me as a concept architect and we work together as sort of a team of four or five people to deliver a unit um, and then we sort of you know, it works where we have phone calls, Skype meetings, we have little meetings in hotels, you know, all around my house, um, you know, and it's sort of, you know, I went from a 300 square foot office back to my home office at home, and then actually we're now building a studio at home where I want to use it for YouTube and a home studio to have clients. I mean, if people, if architects really ask themselves how many architects ever, uh, how many clients ever come to an architect's home or architect's office um none none at all i mean i think i've had about two clients that have ever come to my office in the t in the in the whole time that i had this 300 square foot office all set up for meetings no one ever came because developers were like oh come, come and see us on site come and see us here come and see us there you know the office is actually the client's home you know that's that's where i was um so yeah so streamlining the office just to, to me Got the got the overheads down, so my cow was jumping for joy. <laughs> um, you know, moving back to home and now building an office at home. You know that that's actually going to be an investment for us for the long term. And then actually looking at where where the staff are now. You know, I've now taken that responsibility uh, and split it with them. You know, the risk the risk in terms of my exposure is actually now reduced because I'm I'm working with a team of professionals that all have their own insurance as well. Right. So if something goes wrong, I know we're all covered. You know, my mine is the umbrella. Mine is the big company. You know, the parent company. So everyone will come back and sue me. That's fine. I know that I can if I have to, I can take those other people to task if I need to. Touch wood, it's never happened and shouldn't that happen. Um, but, you know, if, if we've ever had a problem, we've worked it all out. You know, we've had to. You know, we work as a unit. They rely on me uh, to sort of give them work. And sometimes they've actually been coming to me with clients because that's how, you know, the nice thing is when they take ownership of it, they they become your they become your spokesman as well. They're engaged because they're realising, well, look, I don't want to, they don't want to take the project on themselves. But Barry could be our chief architect. And then we'll do the work in drawings because that's what they're good at, mm. you know. So let's do that. So let's work like that. And that's how a collaborative approach works. So it's really, it has really streamlined. We, you know, there's only four, four of us that are actually sort of doing design and one structure engineer. And it's been, it's been great. It's Amazing. been great. Brilliant. And you were, meant, you were saying earlier how like you've kind of shifted your identity now from being a marketeer first and then an architect second. What does what does that mean? And what kind of what does your daily marketing activities look like? Do you do something every day? Or is yeah. It so, so, right. So, architect hat on. I probably work two days a week as an architect. Three days a week, I am literally marketing. If you look at it, that that amount of time and 
no and people are probably screaming at it now going how how's he getting any work done my typical day is sort of I'm up at sort of six, seven o'clock and I'll do work for sort of two to three hours, sort of go and meet up with somebody for coffee, go and have a meeting with somebody. And then sort of my day is probably seven till 10. It's really revolved around my lifestyle. I, I, my architecture is my life and life is around, you know, architecture. And I just, I just sit there and go, I'll, I'll fit this in during the day. But every morning I probably, I look at the emails, see how many leads have been generated from the day before. I'll send them all out this project planning pack. I'll then phone up some clients. So my, so literally from 6 a.m. till 2, no one can call me. My, call, my phone is on do not disturb. Uh, it annoys the clients, but they get used to it. And then literally from 2 till 6, clients can call me and talk to me because then I'll spend the afternoon. But I'm really productive in the morning. I get like I literally get a whole day's work done in like four hours, you know. But that's with no distraction. And you have to be disciplined like that. You have mm. to sort of discipline yourself to know that you can get four hours work done. I mean, phones have been terrible because someone's always sending me an email. I probably get like 20 emails a day. But marketing-wise, first two hours of every day, I'm doing I'm doing a little bit of marketing. I'm either sending I'm either preparing a bit of the newsletter. Uh, I'm either doing email follow ups. I'm either following up um, with project planning packs. Or I'm following up with people to arrange for coffees to sort of go and have a little chat with them. And free, free like even now like this is marketing to me. This is not this is not me having an interview. This is marketing brain. This is sort of this is time being well spent delivering and expanding my practice. You know. Um, and it's about sp- spreading the brand. I mean, you saw it earlier on. I've got, I've got branded jackets and T-shirts and, you know, it's about that brand identity that I want, mm. you know, and marketeer first, architect second. And it's it's and it really has improved my practice. It's made me think and it's, stream, it's actually helped me streamline the business of pronascinating about what I do day to day. I've now gone right. I've had to. I've got to be efficient. You know, I've got this. You know, I've got to do eighty percent work, and I've only got twenty percent of my time to do it. And I just literally focus on what I need to do, deliver, move on. Um, but then at the weekends, I rest easy. You know, I go and play hockey. You know, I socialise. I go and see friends, and then then Monday morning, same routine. So what's next? Yeah, next is. Um, more the same. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually working on a YouTube channel at the moment. Hence why we're doing the home studio. So part of the YouTube channel will be talking about how to build a home studio, especially for YouTubers, because uh, that's something that seems to be a bit of a craze at the moment. But I don't think there's enough architects out there that in the UK that seem to do YouTube. The one that always I defer to is Eric Reinhold and Thirty by Forty. I absolutely adore what he's done and yeah, brought amazing. and brought architecture to the masses in that kind of simplistic, but it's so full of content and there's so much there for everybody to take away from if you're an architect if you're a student even if you're a potential client you know and so i would like to try and think i can emulate some of that here in the uk um but we'll see but that but my goal this year is so goal is launch a youtube channel and be consistent with that so try and get weekly on that and then as i was saying earlier on my main target is i'm going to have all the stuff you know financially and marketeering wise I just want to sit there and go right I've got enough work now to get me through to August I'm actually going to close the door in the quietest month because everyone goes on holiday I'll come back in September and we'll pick it up from there and I know the system and the practice can run without me and I will just just have a month off and I feel like a proper Frenchman and I can <laughs> call myself Atelier <laughs> um, so um, yeah so that's where that's where I really want to be in the next 12 months brilliant yeah. amazing Barry thank you so much for your time today that's been a whirlwind of brilliance and entrepreneurial might so thank you very much thank you Ryan cheers thank you very much so that is a wrap thank you for listening The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.